This is the ASUS ZenBook 15, and it's one of the most compact 15-inch notebooks that I've ever come across, and it's one of the very first notebooks to hit the studios featuring a Comet Lake processor. Not only that, but it has a few cool features like a built-in secondary display that also acts as a trackpad, as well as a discrete graphics card, and it's well-priced considering that the specs it features. Now, I was really curious to test out a few things on this notebook. The first one being whether or not if Comet Lake offers any benefits over Ice Lake because Intel is sampling or selling both those processors in similar notebooks uh, and that definitely causes confusion among customers. The next thing is that second screen. Is it any beneficial to my workflow? And finally, Asus is claiming some crazy battery life on this notebook. So if that checks out, then this might be one of the best Ultrabooks around. So let's take a deep dive on the ZenBook 15 right after this. The Razer Death Adder V2, the gaming icon that just got upgraded with a lighter body, next-gen sensor, and optical switches for maximum reliability and speed, the classic ergonomic shape handles like no other. Find out why 10 million other users love the Death Adder down below. All right, so before I get into the details, I do want to preface something very important. Asus isn't targeting the ZenBook 15 at gamers but rather people who appreciate having a fairly large screen with really good battery life and adequate performance to boost heavy tasks like video editing, photo editing, or 3D work, or just anything that would benefit from an additional discrete graphics card. Now, if you're wondering about the differences between Ice Lake and Comet Lake, here's a quick breakdown. Ice Lake basically features a high-end iGPU, but less x86 performance because it's a new architecture, which is 10 nanometers. Comet Lake, on the other hand, is a continuation of Whiskey Lake, which is the 14 nanometer process, but its enhanced uh, x86 performance definitely helps with multi-core tasks. If you're interested in learning more about these processors, make sure to check out our explain video, which will be linked down below. Now, taking a look at the specs on the ZenBook 15, it's actually really impressive for a slim, thin and light notebook. Basically, this is an updated version of last year's ZenBook 15, but with refreshed internals. So it features a Core i7-10510U processor. Yes, Intel's naming scheme is ridiculous. It's a quad-core chip with eight threads, 16 gigabytes of RAM in dual channel, a one terabyte PCI NVMe SSD, and a GTX 1650 Max-Q. All for about $1,400, which is pretty good price, to be honest, if you compare it to the competition. Now, Asus is planning to launch a lower tier version of the ZenBook 15 with a Core i5 processor and a higher end model with a 4K display with similar specs that I have over here. If you drill down into things, these are pretty much the same specs as the newest Razer Blade Stealth with the GTX 1650 Max-Q graphics card that I tested a while back, and it has more storage space and of course, it's a 15 inch notebook. Now, let's start with the exterior of the ZenBook 15. And I've gotta admit, this is probably one of the most unique designs that I've ever come across on a notebook. The royal blue metal finish along with the rose gold accents really make this thing stand out from the competition. And that trend continues on the inside as well. Props to Asus for keeping the color scheme consistent. Build quality is superb on the ZenBook 15. The chassis is mostly made out of aluminum, so there's barely any flex on the screen and the base. The hinge is really strong and it automatically tilts the keyboard at a three degree angle to optimize your typing experience. Plus, it also helps the notebook breathe a little better. Now, for size comparison, here's a shot compared to the Razorblade Stealth 13 and my Razorblade 15 Advanced model. The ZenBook 15 offers a good balance of size and portability, so this shouldn't be a huge deal breaker to carry around or lug around uh, if you're in school or if you're a business professional because it's fairly thin and light. You can easily tuck this in a backpack. Moving on to the interior, Asus managed to fit a full-size keyboard and the keys themselves are excellent. They feature an adequate amount of travel distance and there's less wobbling around the keys, which is awesome. Seriously, this is miles better than my Razorblade 15. However, I'm not a fan of the tiny arrow keys. It's an absolute nightmare navigating through spreadsheets and other tasks. You'd need baby fingers to use this efficiently. I should mention that the keyboard is backlit, but unfortunately, it's not very bright. Also, keep note that since the accent color on the fonts are rose gold, the final output is a bit on the warmer side, and I also noticed that lighting wasn't consistent on some keys. For those of you wondering, this is what the webcam quality looks like on the ZenBook 15. The one thing that I do want to pay close attention to is the audio, because if you pay close attention, there is a weird high-pitched sound. It's, it's definitely bad. I would certainly not use this when I'm in Skype conference calls or anything remotely close to that, because it's just, it's bad. Now, typically on any other notebook review, I dive right into the trackpad, 
but it's a bit of a different story on the ZenBook 15. You see, ASUS decided to integrate a 5.7 inch display that also functions as a trackpad. Think of it as a secondary display to complement your primary screen. I remember taking a look at something like this from HP on their Omen 2S, but I didn't have the best experience. And unfortunately, I have to say the same thing for this laptop. Let me quickly walk you through what comes out of the box. Here, you're essentially greeted with what ASUS calls ScreenPad OS. I see that they've taken inspirations from Android. As you can see, you have quick access to the Num key, which is sort of pointless since you have a dedicated numpad in the first place. Next up is the handwriting tab for natural text input. But ironically, it took me longer to compose sentences since it doesn't automatically register what you write. That's a fail in my opinion. Then there's the Quick Key app that displays hotkeys that's frequently used like copy, paste, select. But these are things that I can quickly perform on a physical keyboard, so I don't understand the purpose of this feature. Now, you can create quick shortcuts for specific apps that use various key combinations. ASUS only allows two to four hotkeys in total. And I do see this being useful for applications like AutoCAD but that takes a while to set up and you have to give yourself some time to get used to this because you're introducing something new to your workflow. So it could increase or decrease your productivity. It's either a win or a lose case scenario. I personally didn't find it that useful because I found myself constantly stressing my neck because I was looking down for the most part, just trying to figure things out. So that was definitely something that I thought was worth bringing up because you are looking down instead of, it, it doesn't really come to your peripheral vision. So, um, that was definitely a little bit odd, but it could be a different story for someone who potentially uses various complex key combinations. Maybe you'll find that one tap super useful. The remaining apps are basically extensions from Microsoft's Office Suite. You only get basic formatting controls, which may or may not benefit you. Here comes the worst part though. A lot of these ScreenPad optimized apps like Calculator, online video player that works cohesively with YouTube and other platforms, and Adobe's sign-in app straight up don't work. Even after installing them manually, it just ended up launching the Microsoft Store, which was really frustrating. It actually turns out that some of these apps are not optimized to run on this version of ScreenPad. So it really goes to show how incomplete this ecosystem is. The trackpad can be enabled by simply swiping from the bottom of the display and tapping on this icon, but that's also broken because sometimes when I boot into Windows, the trackpad just doesn't work, which means I won't be able to navigate through the Windows UI. So the only solution to that was to disable ScreenPad and then enable it through the function command. So that was a little bit frustrating. I'm a little bit skeptical about this whole screen implementation because I'm not sure how durable it's gonna be. Now you can permanently disable ScreenPad uh, and just use it as a standalone trackpad because that seems to solve most of the issues, but it also defeats the purpose of getting this laptop because of that screen and if that's something that you're looking into. The speakers are bottom facing and they sound okay. There's no bass, it definitely lacks body to the sound. So yeah, not the greatest. Port selection is decent. On the left-hand side, you get a USB 3.1 Gen 1 port and an audio jack. Switching over to the right, you'll find power in, HDMI, a Type-A and Type-C port, both of which support the USB 3.1 Gen 2 standard, and surprisingly, a full-size SD card slot. That was very thoughtful, ASUS. Keep in mind that it's not UHS-2 certified for faster cards. The lack of a Thunderbolt 3 port is definitely disappointing. It would have been nice if ASUS included that on this notebook, but that's not the case. The ZenBook 15 comes with a 15.6 inch 1080p display. ASUS doesn't quite mention if they're using an IPS panel, but they claim that it covers 100% of the sRGB color space, but from our tests, that wasn't the case as our sample only covers 92%. So I wouldn't rely on this screen for professional color work. It also doesn't get that bright. So outdoor visibility is completely out of question. Plus it does come with a glossy finish. So there's that, but there will be a matte version later on. I also noticed a little bit of backlit bleed around the top portion of the display, but the rest of the screen is just fine. And look, for casual content consumption and maybe a little bit of gaming, this screen will get the job done. If you're looking to upgrade the ZenBook 15, there's not a lot that can be done. So when you open up the notebook, you're only greeted with a single M.2 slot that's already populated with the one terabyte NVMe SSD. The memory is soldered onto the PCB, so that is not upgradable. And so yeah, storage is the only thing that can be upgraded on this notebook. Interestingly enough, I found that the thermal pad that they added onto the SSD is actually attached to a plastic uh, cover. So yeah, I'm not sure if that was really a smart move by ASUS because there's no thermal dissipation happening because it's basically touching plastic material. But yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. The ZenBook 15 comes with a 71 watt hour unit and it was outstanding guys. 
Asus claims up to 15 hours, but I was only able to get a little over nine hours from our standard light load test. And compared to the Blade Stealth 13 and the XPS 13 2-in-1, this is really amazing considering that it packs a discrete graphics card. Under heavy load, it's lower than most other thin end lights, but that could be due to the fact that it has a 15 inch screen and a discrete graphics card. Finally, let's talk about performance. And honestly, this is what really got me excited, guys, because that Comet Lake CPU is no slouch. It performs really well in our single core tests. Uh, and when I compare that to something like the 1065 G7 Ice Lake processor found on the XPS 13 2-in-1, it gives us an additional 5 to 10% performance. I mean, looking at this Blender result, you can clearly tell that those sustained higher clock speeds on the ZenBook really helped shave those render times. And the same story applies to our Corona benchmark. Moving on to Premiere Pro, the 1650 Max-Q comes in handy to accelerate exports, and it's on par to the Bladestyle GTX featuring that same GPU. But if you look at the XPS 13 2 and one featuring the iStake processor and the integrated iGPU, uh, it definitely falls apart because, like I said, Adobe loves CUDA acceleration, so lack of a discrete graphics card can be seen here. DaVinci Resolve Studio ran flawlessly on the ZenBook. I had no issues scrolling through the timeline. It actually managed to render our 10-minute project without any hiccups, unlike the XPS 13 with that iSlake processor and the integrated Iris Plus graphics. That being said, the CPU does run really hot. Initially, it spikes up to 94C at 3.5 to 3.7 gigahertz under a full multi-core workload, but over time, it throttles the clock speeds down to 3.2 gigahertz on all four cores with temperatures hovering around 84C. Also guys, I should mention that the one terabyte SSD is one of the fastest drives that I've ever come across on a thin and light notebook. What about gaming? Well, you shouldn't have any issues pushing the 1080p display over 100 frames per second in most titles uh, with settings from low to medium. Now, when compared to the Bladestyle 13 GTX, it looks like the Ice Lake processor does come in clutch for that when you pair it with a DGPU. I think that's where the architecture refinements come into play, but it's still very playable. Fan noise is respectable on the ZenBook 15. I'm glad that it doesn't sound like a jet fan under a full multi-core workload. Idle scenarios, it's very quiet, so you shouldn't have any issues in terms of acoustics with this laptop. So what's the story with the Asus ZenBook 15? First of all, I like the fact that Asus went out of the box and designed something that looks unique compared to the competition. I love the design of this thing with the royal blue finish. Definitely, it's a conversation piece when you have something like this uh, with you. The second thing is the CPU performance. I was absolutely amazed at how well that Comet Lake processor was able to sustain those high clock speeds and outperform Ice Lake. And it really goes to show how Intel's older supercharged Whiskey Lake architecture is still superior in terms of CPU performance compared to the 10 nanometer Ice Lake processor. It just, it's, it's kind of ironic. What really surprised me was the battery life. For a 15 inch notebook with a discrete graphics card, getting over nine hours is just absolutely insane. And that was certainly not possible, at least in the last few years. And I'm glad that we're getting to a point where you can actually, you know, carry something like this um, throughout the day without having to worry about plugging it in. That being said, the integration of a secondary display within the trackpad, it looks like a gimmick to me because I don't see myself using it. I also want to touch base on the price of this laptop at $1,400 it's actually a steal because you are getting a really good 15 inch thin and light notebook with some really good CPU performance and good graphics performance compared to the competition like the Blade Stealth 13 GTX, which can easily go for around $1,700, $1,800. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you guys think about the ZenBook 15 from Asus in the comments. I'll be there for a while. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one.